first like to start off by thanking you all for coming, um, the panelists from near and far. Um, it's always a pleasure to have these sessions with Nasser. Um, it's uh, something that we, as the Armenian Student Association, look forward to. So thank you. Um, I find this topic especially important, um, and I'm glad that we'll be able to have this discussion. And I hope that you all find it very interesting. So thank you, Mark. Um, and Thank you, Ani, again, for, for having us here uh, several years ago, three years ago, four years ago, uh, when, when we really made a conscious effort to start doing uh, more in the way of contemporary programs and going to college campuses. This was the place where we started, and uh, we're glad to be back here again to take on this important topic. Tonight's program is uh, as part of the Nasser Alustical Banking Foundation lecture series on contemporary Armenian issues. And these are the kinds of topics that we want to take on in this series that really need to be addressed and perhaps otherwise aren't. So thanks again to the Northeastern Armenian students. Uh, if you didn't get one of these, please take one, uh, not only because it has little bios uh, about the panelists, but it also has some suggestions provided by the panelists on the back for further online uh, reading the resources on some of the issues related to what will be talked about tonight. So, once again, thanks, and uh, I want to hand things over to our moderator, Dr. Anna Ohanian. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming out tonight and um, battling the traffic. We realize it's not easy to uh, get into Boston at this time of the day. And a big thanks to Alan for staying up so late. I believe he's in Germany. Uh, and to panelists for joining us today, finding the time uh, in their busy schedules. I would like to start by reflecting that today is December 7th. Uh, in 1988, um, there was a devastating earthquake in Armenia that wiped out villages and towns and cost um, about 25,000 lives. And this is really a somber reminder of the power of nature, which can destroy uh, physical infrastructure landscapes and shatter our communities and our institutions. Um, the key message for this panel was, is to think about the link between environmental pressures and the way they change the way we think about security. Um, Traditionally, we do think of security in, in terms of borders and militaries. Um, environmental pressures challenge this paradigm. They challenge this paradigm uh, because uh, they highlight issues pertaining to uh, biodiversity, loss of, uh, loss of land. Within the next 100 years or so, it is projected that worldwide, one third of the land will be altered. So uh, uh, issues of public health, issues of mining and their link with public health um, dramatically uh, affect daily lives of our individuals uh, and the, uh, add a whole new, new layer to our understanding of security. So I will get out of, the, uh, of your way. We have, as I mentioned, an exciting panel with us. Um, the, the outline moving forward is that um, the, well, we asked uh, Alwin and Rukhanian to frame the discussion after which we will move to our panelists that are, that are here. Um, I would like to um, introduce the panelists very briefly. You have the hard copies in your hands, uh, but for those of you, I realize that we're streaming. I would like to uh, say a few words about each of, uh, each of the speakers. Alan Armenfanyan is the director of the American University of Armenia, a Kopian Center for the Environment, a position that he has held since 2013. In 2014, he established the AUA Center for Responsible Mining and is acting as its interim director. He teaches graduate and undergraduate courses and, and environmental courses at the AUA, and he has consulted with the World Bank, UNDP, the Brookings Institution, and I can go on and on. He holds a master's degree in city planning from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Department of Urban Studies and Planning. Um, thank you again, Alan, for joining us. Um, we have Ursula Kazarian with us, sitting in the middle, who is the founder and former president of the Armenian Environmental Network. She has worked with local and regional environmental organizations in Yerevan and Tbilisi, and has been involved in, in environmental campaigns in the South Caucasus in 2003. She holds a BA, two MAs, a JD, 
uh, and LLM, and all of which are generally focused in the areas of international relations, uh, environmental security, and sustainable development. Jason Sohikian um, uh, is the deputy director of the Armenia Tree Project, an NGO that has planted 5.5 million trees since 1994. He has a master's in environmental management from Harvard. His research on payment for environmental services was adapted for a TEDx talk. Um, and he's a researcher, was a researcher at the Conservation Finance Forum, where he co-authored a report for the governor of Massachusetts on financing forest conservation. Emma McGride is a first-year student at Boston College Law School. She arrived to Armenia as a Peace Corps volunteer uh, in August of 2014. She did her training in Artashad and was placed in Artabwink village by Yodzor Mars from November 2014 to October 2016. And um, she has taught English uh, classes from grades 3rd to 12. And she has worked on USAID grant projects for new English classrooms, Grow Camp for Armenian Children, Focus on Environmental Protection, and Glow Leadership Camp for Armenian Girls. She misses Armenia every day and hopes to return soon. This was in her bio blur, by the way. I did not add that. So with this, um, at the, in terms of the outline, so we'll, we'll start with our panelists. After they, as they finish, I will, uh, as moderator, I'll do one round, I'll direct one round of questions to them. Depending how much time we have, most likely we will not have much time. I either will or will not do a second round of questions because we do want to have uh, plenty of time for question and answers. And we do want to focus on and end on the note of the grassroots level and as to what can be done about some of the very deep and structural problems that we'll be addressing today. Alan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, well, uh, thanks to all of you for um, uh, organizing this. Uh, Anna uh, reached out uh, earlier on in, in, in the month, and I'm, I'm very glad to be part of this. Um, uh, all the panelists, all the participants, are uh, very glad that uh, we're addressing uh, this a topic that is very um, uh, critical for Armenia's future um, and uh, we have to look at the environment as uh, as not only something to preserve but also something to help Armenia uh, economically grow and uh, uh, but uh, uh, exactly how we do that I think that's the uh, million dollar question so that we don't deplete the resource that uh, that in the long term uh, uh, we uh, we hope uh, will be a, a legacy left to future generations, uh, and also will uh, continuously and sustainably uh, enable Armenia to uh, uh, to economically prosper. Uh, and uh, uh, from uh, our center's point of view, and and uh, my own personal point of view, Armenia has plenty of natural resources that, if it uses wisely. Uh, it will uh, enable the country to be on a more uh, sustainable economic uh, path. So uh, with that, let me just uh, give a very broad context to security. I already mentioned a, a few of the issues. Uh, clearly, uh, Armenia uh, is a landlocked country dependent on a lot of imports for energy and even food. Uh, it uh, has a mineral sector. Uh, that uh, not only is uh, is uh, causing a lot of environmental harm, but also uh, not as much economic benefit as, as mineral sectors can bring to a country. So that's also another uh, security challenge in the long term. And um, and uh, on top of uh, all of this, uh, of course, is this. Uh, uh, a relatively long-term uh, problem of trust in governance and governance structures. And uh, I, I think uh, uh, that's an area that requires very long-term uh, work. Uh, and it's very difficult to establish trust. Uh, and it's very easy to lose trust. It takes much faster to lose trust than to build trust. And, uh, and uh, we can talk about more about that later on, uh, but I also want to uh, point out that sometimes the issues are not only uh, trust and, and lack of transparency and corruption, sometimes the issues have to do also with know-how, lack of know-how. Uh, and, and that creates a lot of insecurity in, in this sector especially, but 
uh, also in other sectors. Uh, just to give you a very uh, small example of, of uh, the issue of know-how, uh, we have been running this Sustainable Energy Academy for the past couple of years. Uh, one of the revelations for us who were running the, the academy, uh, we had a lot of uh, participants from uh, regional governments in the academy on the first year. And one of the issues that we were discussing was uh, the implementation of new uh, energy efficiency regulations in the, in the country, building energy efficiency regulations in the country. And some of the issues that came up uh, were surprising to us and also touching in some ways because some of these people from the regional governments were saying we want to implement these laws but we don't understand them. We call Yerevan and ask them what this means and how we should be implementing it and no one in Yerevan can explain it to us. So we don't know what to do. Uh, so there is sometimes the issue is not necessarily corruption or lack of political will, it's also lack of know-how and we need to be a little bit, uh, I think, open uh, to, to that possibility in, in some cases as well. Um, and and uh, clearly also environment and public health are very uh, deeply connected with each other and Armenia uh, does not lack uh, in, in problems, uh, both environmental as well as, as uh, and public health problems. I mean, we've all heard of the, the uh, the, uh, the statistics that came out that Armenia is among the highest uh, uh, countries with the highest rates of cancer in, in, in the world. Um, now, that, those numbers, of course, have to be looked at more carefully, but uh, there may be something there that we need to uh, think about and worry about uh, and, and study uh, more carefully. So this broadly kind of security uh, 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 context, but let me now focus on some of the environmental, specifically environmental issues. Um, there is uh, uh, the issue of food production, there is the issue of energy uh, production and use, and there is the issue of water use in Armenia. Uh, and more recently there is a, uh, a tendency to package this as this, the food, uh, water, energy nexus. Uh, and I think uh, Armenia has a lot uh, to think about in these areas. Energy uh, sector is the one sector that Armenia has, has really been very progressive and very, very advanced in the regional context. Um, and uh, uh, sure, we have a nuclear power plant that is a cause for concern uh, for all of us. Uh, on the other hand, without the nuclear power plant, we also know uh, we will have a lot of problems at this point. So the, the issue of nuclear, uh, the nuclear power plant, it's going to be something that's going to be around our neck for the next uh, couple of decades until we figure out uh, uh, how we can do without it. Uh, and at the same time, the Armenian government has had a very uh, progressive uh, policy on, on, um, on energy security. Um, uh, with that, um, there's a lot to talk about. Um, of course, diversification of energy sources. Uh, but uh, with respect to renewables, uh, more recently there is a very strong push on, on uh, especially photovoltaic and solar thermal collect, uh, energy uh, sources uh, in Armenia. Armenia is in the process of uh, building uh, uh, about a 70 megawatt capacity of, of solar uh, photovoltaic plants in the country. Uh, there have been uh, about 10 1 megawatt plants approved uh, and one of them came online last well, couple of weeks ago and one is soon to come online and over the next couple of years we're going to have another 8 megawatts coming on, online. Uh, and there's one that in Maastricht, uh, east of Sevan, there's going to be a, a, a big 55 megawatt plant uh, being built. So uh, in terms of diversifying and, and uh, you know, increasing the renewable share of Armenia's uh, power uh, generation, uh, I think Armenia is on the right path. Uh, we experimented with uh, uh, hydropower. Uh, it's about a third of Armenia's power comes from hydropower, uh, and, and some of that was not done environmentally uh, uh, responsibly. And, and that probably the issue there particularly had to do with bad laws and legislation we had uh, for environmental releases that are, are uh, 
or uh, to be part of the when you design a hydropower plant you have to let enough water go through so the ecosystem can benefit from uh, the water system uh, or the water or the rivers as well uh, and their legislation really was uh, deficient and, and uh, a lot of the power plants uh, have done uh, damage to some of the, the local ecosystems uh, but uh, but with the hydropower plants uh, sorry with the uh, photovoltaics uh, there is a, an environmental review process they're going to go through and also there's a big push on on very um, distributed energy generation and and so I think on the energy sector Armenia is is on the right path uh, there's going to be challenges in the process but but I think uh, there uh, there's a lot to look forward to and and, and help communities adopt uh, these, these technologies uh, and and, and the, the part of this, of course, is to create the resilience that we need in, in the Armenia's energy uh, sector. We all remember the early 1990s and the, the, uh, the, the difficulty that the country went through when we didn't have highly centralized energy generation and highly dependent on imports uh, for, for uh, primary fuel. So, um, uh, with respect to water, uh, water, of course, uh, has a relationship to food production and and uh, and energy production, but itself uh, is 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 uh, one of the assets Armenia has. Armenia, on the whole, is a water-rich country. Uh, uh, there are parts that are not, but there are parts of Armenia that are uh, sufficiently uh, water endowed. Uh, and and yet we are not very water smart. I would even say we're water stupid. Uh, and uh, and so uh, there we have a lot to do to reduce the water use, especially in the agriculture sector. Uh, and within the agriculture sector, uh, both farming and also aquaculture has been a tremendous pressure on the underground water resources in the Arad Plain. Uh, and um, uh, and. There, uh, we need to do a lot of work. Uh, with water, uh, it's not only been use of water, but it's also been pollution of water that's been an issue in Armenia. The pollution of water comes from agriculture uh, with the pesticides and the fertilizers, but it also comes from a mining sector, uh, which has almost zero control over the quality of water that's released into the uh, after being used for the mineral processing. Uh, uh, released into the into the river system. Uh, who knows what the impact is on the underground water reserves? No one has studied that. Um, and um, and also, um, uh, I think uh, uh, there is no sewer treatment in Armenia. Other than we have six plant sewer uh, uh, treatment plants, a lot of them don't do the full treatment process. Uh, they go up to a certain level. Uh, they do have some benefit, but these are also very recent phenomena. So, uh, so that's uh, the, the issue of water is, is a serious issue, and within the drinking water supply, uh, which uh, starting from the beginning of this year, only one utility company is now serving the entire country. Uh, it used to be five companies uh, uh, serving different now uh, under the new agreement that uh, uh, the government has with Veolia. Uh, it's a French company. Uh, we uh, have the, the Veolia is the single operator in the country, and they will have to improve the uh, deliver the, the water supply, drinking water supply to uh, to the entire country um, under one tariff, uh, and start also implementing uh, components of uh, wastewater collection and uh, and treatment. Um, a very huge task uh, in their hands, but also the whole drinking water system has a lot of, of, of waste and loss. Uh, it's estimated that about 70% of Armenia's uh, drinking water supply gets lost from the point of extraction to the point of consumption. Uh, that's a very big uh, rate of loss. Uh, it's uh, Of course, the water goes back into the ecosystem, but uh, it's uh, it's extracting from a lot of underground resources that are very precious, and then releasing it onto surface levels, which can evaporate or go to basically to the river systems and off to the Caspian Sea. Um, so uh, there is a lot to uh, to do in the water sector as, as well. There is uh, in connection with uh, uh, energy uh, sector. Um, 
I forgot to mention that there is, of course, a very uh, troubling connection between deforestation and, and the energy sector. A lot of rural areas are uh, dependent on fuel wood uh, for their uh, heating. And uh, that is an area that requires a considerable amount of work. We've been trying to uh, work in rural communities, as some other organizations have also tried to do. Uh, there, the issue, uh, you cannot, uh, you know, this is the livelihood of, of a lot of the, the communities that live next to the forests. Um, and also, so it's, uh, it, it's the source of, of heating and survival for a lot of these communities. Uh, and so uh, our approach has been to uh, pretty much diminish demand as, much, as fast as possible by introducing energy efficiency solutions, uh, better heating uh, uh, um, uh, solutions, uh, for, uh, you know, more efficient stoves. Uh, but also the government recently has started the push of introducing thermal, uh, solar thermal collectors and subsidizing in some ways, subsidizing the uh, adoption of these technologies. And uh, it seems to be working. I think in, in, in five years we're going to see a lot of the rural areas having uh, solar thermal collectors. And photovoltaic for electricity generation may follow, but, but solar thermal I think is going to catch on very fast because the prices are pretty affordable. Um, and, and once rural areas, people use them, then word of mouth is going to help to really spread the technology. Um, so forests, of course, uh, are, are directly linked to the species biodiversity and ecosystem biodiversity. And, and there, uh, you know, uh, overall, uh, we don't, um, uh, the, to the best of my knowledge, and I talk to, to the biologists and, and uh, uh, that are working in those areas, we don't see a collapse of species uh, uh, like we see in, in some other uh, parts of the world. Uh, uh, but of course, the, you know, we're talking about thousands and thousands of species, so it's hard to keep track of all of them. And especially because we uh, don't have, um, and this is one of the governance issues in the biodiversity sector as uh, issue, is as, uh, we don't have a cadaster, biodiversity cadaster in the country. That's something that is supposed to be developed uh, within the, the confines of the, uh, of the requirements of the Convention on Biological Diversity. Uh, one thing Armenia has done, it has uh, increased its, its uh, share of, of, uh, of land that is covered uh, as protected area. So we about 13% of Armenia's uh, land now is, is protected area. We're supposed to get up to 17% uh, over the next uh, you know uh, decade or two, uh, and that's 17% is the international uh, standard. Uh, I'm see Anna stood up. Uh, am I? Uh, should I wrap up quickly? Uh, maybe you like yeah. in a minute or two. Okay. All right. So. Um, uh, the the other issue I want to, and two more issues if I could point out, one has to do with uh, 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 climate change adaptation. Armenia is not a carbon intensive economy, does not have a carbon intensive economy, uh, but uh, we whatever happens globally will affect us. And some of the scenarios uh, that, um, uh, that uh, the extreme scenario is that, that uh, has been studied uh, uh, Armenia may lose 30% of its uh, precipitation over the next uh, 50, 60 years, in which case our energy sector is going to be impacted, our food production system is going to be impacted, uh, and, and of course water availability in a lot of communities is going to be uh, severely impacted. So uh, I think that's uh, an area that Armenia needs to focus on if those extreme scenarios do happen. Uh, then uh, we need to figure out where we're getting our water, where we're getting our food from, and where we're getting our, our energy uh, from. Uh, so, um, and, and then uh, the last issue that we've spent a lot of time and, and at, the, at the university on over the past few years is the, is the, problem, is the issue of mining. Uh, mining is not a big employer in Armenia and is not a big component of the, of the, uh, uh, of the GDP. 30% uh, of the GDP come, is attributable to mining, and 3% of the employment in the country is attributable to mining. Uh, what it is significant, why uh, there's a lot of emphasis on it, is because it is a big currency earner, hard currency earner for the country. Uh, and uh, and uh, I think 20 or 25% of the exports uh, are attributable to the mining sector. Uh, but of course, 
that just means we're not exporting much else and, and we need to become more active in exporting other stuff and, and other services. Uh, that and and, and uh, it's not necessarily that it has to remain that that kind of a big component of the of the sector and and uh, why so much focus on money uh, mining uh, because uh, the mining that is being done in Armenia it's uh, metal mining mostly um, uh, in terms of the large volumes that we're talking about and uh, metal mining can be highly toxic uh, to the environment. Uh, and can have a lot of uh, damage to the do a lot of damage to the environment and the communities that live around the mining operation, and there we have significant issues with governance and and uh, monitoring and ensuring that uh, public health and environmental health is is uh, secured. So may I do with that? Um, Thank you. Thank you very broad much. issues that I think are, are uh, critical to our. Okay. Thank you so much. I'm sure there are going to be lots of questions, so you, you, you actually get a lot of food for thought for us, so uh, it's great that you're hanging around. Thank you. So uh, let's move to perhaps Ursula. Priorities, that, issues that you think are, are a priority in environmental governance or environmental security, environmental statecraft. Um, five, seven. I'm going to do my best. No, absolutely. Um, okay, can, every, can everyone hear me? No. 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 Turn up the mic. Yeah. Well, it, it looks like it's <laughs> there we go. It's green. Green, green. that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Um, well, I, first I just want to thank everyone um, who put together this event. I am thrilled to be here and to know that this um, topic is um, being presented in this type of platform. I've been waiting for a day like this. Um, so thank you very much. And um, thank you, Ellen, because you actually... Uh, oh. Thank you, uh, because you actually touched on a, a few topics that I wanted to squeeze into my five to seven minutes. Um, the downside is that I have comments about a few of those, those issues, but I'll try and save some of those for the question and answer um, session. So uh, I was asked to speak a bit about what good environmental governance looks like, generally speaking, and also in the Armenian context. Um, and the short answer, the shortest answer I can come up with, which is a little bit obnoxious, um, is good environmental governance would be whatever the answer is for good governance. And uh, the reason that I say that, and I, I, will, I, will, I will say more than that, but, but the reason that I say that is because um, not unlike sustainable development, uh, you know, before sustainable development was a term um, and, and that encompassed economic uh, social and environmental considerations, there's three pillars to it, um, people discussed them separately. So it was economic development or economic growth, social development, things we still talk about today, and that's, that's totally fine. There are social issues that deserve their own platform as well. Um, and environmental issues also deserve their own platform, specifically in my view because they've been so long, uh, you know, ignored or put to the side um, and often sort of Kind of like, well, you know, if, if this economy grows uh, to a certain level where everyone can just agree that we're okay now, um, you know, quality of life is okay, uh, GDP is okay, you know, then we can worry about environmental issues. Um, but I think, especially in the past, you know, century or so, um, it's really come to our attention following um, advances in, you know, industrialization and all of that. I mean, people didn't necessarily know right off the bat that there was going to be the types of pollution that, you know, we, we kind of had to learn that the hard way, right? And so uh, I think we know that it matters if our water, if we can't drink it, or if we're going to get sick, or if we're going to die. Um, if our air is polluted, same thing. Um, you know, we're, we are still catching up. Um, there, it is a constant catch-up game. Um, and that's not to say that private actors who may benefit, so corporations, uh, but not only corporations, um, you know, mining comes to mind right off the bat, uh, you know, may know that they're not uh, cleaning up after themselves. They may know that they're polluting. They may not know the full extent, just as we don't know the full extent of what that pollution, um, you know, or, or what is actually going into the water. We can only guess. We can make educated guesses, but we can't really test it. And one of the reasons for that is, and, and I'm jumping ahead a little bit in what I wanted to, you know, in the order I wanted to go, but I will say one of the reasons for that, because Alan also brought this up, is that, um, well, for many years now, the Armenian government hasn't allowed, and, and Alan or anyone, uh, please feel free to correct me, but up until, you know, the 
very recent years, I know that the Iranian government has not really sanctioned or allowed um, independent study of the ramifications of mining activities, also the area near Metzamur. So we have anecdotal evidence. I, I, I've spoken to many people, probably many of you have, uh, who have cousins or, or friends who live near these places, and they'll say there are higher uh, rates of cancer in these areas. Um, I've heard really weird stories like glow-in-the-dark vegetables near Metzamur. You know, I don't know about that one, but, but you know, illnesses, um, higher rates of miscarriages, um, infant mortality rates. Uh, and, and other types of illnesses. So, so really, we're talking about um, security, right? This is, and, and, and you framed this perfectly. I also was going to make that point um, that the way we look at security, the traditional sort of format, the tra traditional paradigm, um, may, it, at least for our intents and purposes, you know, here today, may need to be broadened. And you know, uh, usually we think of national security, right? We think of a, a people or a place. We, we put borders around it. We say there's an us, a we, and a them. And when we do that, then we open ourselves to being vulnerable. Um, and I think you can see that in the US today uh, and many places around the world. When you do that, when you have an identity that is so defined, um, this is what we need to keep secure, right? Uh, so then you become vulnerable to being able to point uh, to another, to an other, uh, for for just about anything you want. If you, you can sh you can pass the blame to an other, um, and that, in, to a large extent, I don't want to get too far into politics today, but to a large extent, I think that that is um, an issue in the South Caucasus. So um, redefining what security is, bringing that back and saying, you know, who are, for whom, who are we trying to protect? What are we trying to secure, aside from land? I'm assuming that we care about the people. And if we're looking at the level of individuals, and we're looking at villages, and we're looking at communities of towns, Yerevan, any size, um, and we're not paying as much attention to the rates of cancer and, and you know raising awareness that we can't even get good data on that, um, that's something we should have good data on. That's something that shouldn't be so hard um, to ascertain, to prove or disprove. We shouldn't be going off of anecdotal evidence this, this late in the game, you know, knowing that people are sick, people are dying. Um, and so, you know, I think, uh, I, you know, I originally thought I would probably talk about geopolitics, but really when we're talking about security, um, environmental security in particular, when we're looking at the in individual level, I think it would benefit us to look internally, look at what um, Alan has also described, you know, monitoring, um, and, and that goes back to governance. So, of course, with regional and local um, government officials, often they don't know, they do need training, that's very true. Um, but there has been a lot of money, on, on the flip side of that, there has been a lot of money put into uh, the national government um, to fortify exactly those processes. Um, that's how we reform the laws that aren't being enforced. That's how we came up with these Western sort of oriented laws. We have some good laws on the books and they aren't being enforced. Um, and we could look at whether money was put into uh, how to implement. And we don't, we don't follow up on those things. And uh, you know, I know we were talking about what can we do? Um, this is a very difficult question, and especially when we're not in the country, what can we do? That's one of the things we can do. We can follow up on uh, looking at who's win winning these private bids. Sorry, I'm really thirsty. Who's winning these private bids? Um, and who are the public officials who are in charge of, you know, it, because there's always a public-private um, agreement in all of these things. So, so, and, and again, I'm getting a little bit out of order, but because I, I, I just found it very interesting, a lot of um, what was brought up by Alan. So, I also think um, it might, and then I can I can kind of wrap up after this um, to try and keep it short for the question and answer session. But I, I wanted to take a step back and look at a couple of other examples. Um, and one that came to mind, other than the U.S., um, which that, that could get mired in things. So uh, Costa Rica came to mind. I lived there for a year. And 
you know, it, it, if any of you have been there, you know it is a very beautiful place. Um, they pride themselves on having an afforestation rate instead of a deforestation rate. Um, that's true. There are criticisms and they're valid, um, just having studied that and lived there. Uh, but that's true. They do have an afforestation rate that they can, they can tout. Uh, recently, they were in the news for, you know, running on completely renewable uh, resources, renewable energy. So these things are, you know, uh, you, would, you would think that their environmental security is probably in the bag, but it's always, it's always a, a balance. So in 1948, they, uh, Costa Rica actually abolished its army and said, so just on the security angle, they abolished their army and said to the international community, we're counting on you to keep us safe. So that's a security angle, but now they have a paramilitary for their police so they do have an army that's just not their army. They're dependent, they took the dependency, they chose to be dependent primarily on the US, not unlike Armenia being dependent on Russia and choosing that, but maybe feeling like they didn't necessarily have a choice, right? Um, and, and taking that choice and saying, in exchange, we will create you know, an economy based on a healthy environment. Um, we will promote ecotourism. We will do, you know, switch from deforestation to afforestation. This is going to be our new economy. But to this day, and I don't know how many people know this or not, you know, but in the East in particular, coming up from Panama, you have smuggling of every kind, including contraband, including uh, uh, endangered species, uh, people, drugs. Uh, this all goes through from Panama through the Caribbean, um, right through Costa Rica, and. Uh, on top of that, you know, there's there's a huge sea turtle conservation uh, initiative in in the same area. And uh, not too long ago, there was an environment a uh, local environmentalist who was killed brutally, and two Americans were kidnapped with him and they escaped. But you know, we don't really t we don't follow up on these things. Um, maybe we don't know where to look. I don't know. But when bringing that back to the Armenian example, I mean, Costa Rica is supposed to be you know. Uh, this model, and they have serious issues that no one talks about, or that you know very few people talk about, um, and and they don't have necessarily. Um, and, and this isn't it, it's not just them either. The point is is that it's everywhere. Uh, these are patterns of uh, power dynamics. So it's not just because we have bad neighbors, or you know a lot of the things that I usually hear with. Um, security, security talk for the South Caucasus. It's not just because we're, we're landlocked. It's not just because of any one thing. Um, there are many factors, and that's why I say environmental security really is just one cog of security as a whole. Um, but when we look at the resources that are shared, um, it, you know, they can play a role. And um, I guess I can, I can, I'm actually going backwards in the way that I had intended to present this, so I'll wrap up with this last point if that's okay. Um, but, you know, one way that, that environmental issues are sort of um, typically brought into security discussions, uh, just, just one, for example, is uh, for transboundary issues or transboundary resources. So, for instance, it could be a river. Um, you know, it's in everyone's interest. Let's say it goes right down a border, right? It's in everyone's interest for that river uh, to stay clean, to be able to be used for maybe for commerce, you know, uh, for agriculture. Uh, if it if they pollute that river, everyone loses. And um, I actually have so so many things, but I'm, I'm going to cut myself off. But um, in Armenia, in particular, there are many areas um, where sort of political stability um, during the Soviet times, uh, people were relocated for political reasons, and now they don't have water. They have really serious environmental issues. That could be considered environmental security. That's also an opportunity. So sometimes you see a transboundary resource like a river or um, you know anything that, that can sustain a population or help to, um, and people fight over it. It escalates the conflict. Uh, we see this in the Middle East a lot. Um, but it also can be a potential opportunity to bring people together. And as we were talking about the other week, um, it often is a very successful opportunity. It's, it's used successfully to uh, bring people on the one on one level, the individual level, because you know, when you do talk about what you have in common, it's very hard to fight, or it's much harder. And um, I think that I, I, I'll leave it there for now. Um, maybe we can talk about it more in the discussion, but I think looking internally for what we can improve um, 
in our own security within our own borders uh, would be a very good first step to looking you know, outwards as well. trees. What is the value of a tree? Um, so in Armenia, our forest cover. In the 18th century, the forest cover was 18% and it was down to 11% by the forest inventory conducted in 1988 and it was estimated at only 8% just a few years ago. Uh, now the levels have risen slightly, somewhere between 8 and 11%. Um, there's some debate over this. Uh, and our forest type, they're primarily uh, oak, beech, hornbeam, and pine uh, trees. The, there were high levels of deforestation, especially after independence, when the country was blockaded. There was a lack of alternative fuel supplies, and people were forced to uh, cut trees for cooking and heating fuel. And another environmental issue facing Armenia that's been a driver of deforestation as well uh, from going back to the 19th century even is mining primarily for copper and gold which uh, Alan made some reference to. Um, what are some of the values that people place on trees? Uh, fuel wood, official statistics say 65,000 cubic meters of firewood are used annually for cooking and heating. Uh, it's about 20,000 cords of wood. The actual number is probably three times this figure if you take into account illegal logging. Uh, forests provide habitat for birds and animals. Some of the more interesting types we have in Armenia, bezoar goat, lynx, and the Caucasian leopard, uh, which are all shown here in camera trap photos by the World Wildlife Fund. Deforestation causes landslides and flooding in uh, mountainous rural areas. Trees can have a, a mitigating effect on these types of natural disasters. And of course, fruit is one of the more iconic and desirable attributes of trees. In Armenia, uh, apricot and pomegranate are two well-known uh, fruits. Trees often line public streets, public parks, provide air purification and much needed shade in summer. Uh, and many craftsmen use wood for handmade goods like games, uh, tourist souvenirs, and children's toys. And of course, there's many other values and benefits from trees, including uh, climate change mitigation, which is no small um, ecosystem service. Uh, now, Turning to what we do at the Tree Project, our first program in 1994 was called Community Tree Planting, planting native tree seedlings grown in our own nurseries at public sites throughout Armenia. We placed a big emphasis on fruit trees, growing as many as our nurseries would allow. Some of the most common types of fruit, apricot, peach, apple, and pear. By the time we realized urban tree planting was not going to reverse the tide of tree loss, we embarked on larger scale forestry in 2004. And our forestry sites are located in northern Armenia in rural mountainous areas that faced massive tree losses in the 90s. At the same time, we realized tree planting wasn't enough and we introduced Armenia's first environmental education program by publishing a teacher's manual and offering hands-on lessons to students from all of the regions. So our trees provide many benefits or ecosystem services like clean air and food security. And another huge co-benefit is the creation of tree planting jobs in rural areas burdened by poverty. So here's a few slides just I'll breeze through these, showing some before and after photos of our planting sites. Uh, since 1994, again, it was mentioned by Anna earlier, we've planted 5.5 million trees. 
Of that total, 500,000 were fruit trees, uh, around 10% of our uh, output. The fruit harvested from the trees has been more than 5 million pounds, all to the benefit of local communities. Uh, we have 80 full-time employees in Armenia and hire dozens of workers during spring and fall plantings. And we've planted at more than a thousand sites like this all over the country. Um, I just wanted to close, since she couldn't be here, by a quote uh, by our founder, Carolyn Mugar, who's not a very public person, but it was her vision and her dedication behind the scenes that drives what we do at the Armia Tree Project. Uh, when we were reflecting on what we're doing for our 20th anniversary, she said at the, fa at the time of our founding, people were saying, how can you plant trees when we have so many emergency needs? And our answer is, it's exactly at the moment when there seems there's no hope, when you have to plant a tree, which is all about the belief in the future of our nation. It was a very bleak time because that's when the blockade started. And we traveled to the countryside and saw the deforestation, and we said, we have to do something about it. So I thank you, and I, I look forward to uh, the discussion tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jason. Um, and let's move on to Emma to talk about the grassroots level. Um, I was a Peace Corps volunteer for two years um, in a village called Archipoy, which is not well known by that name. It's actually well known by Yerigis, which is where Sabatabert is. Um, so I just wanted to speak. I'm not an expert on the environment in Armenia, um, but I just wanted to give like anecdotes, stories, um, different perspectives that I saw when I was there and that my friends saw when they were there. Um, so, and I, my village is north of Yerikanzor in Bailsor Mars, which is on the map right there. Um, so I, uh, there's kind of a mystery surrounding villages where a lot of people don't really know what life is like there, so I kind of wanted to give a very, um, brief synopsis on it. Um, obviously, villages, there aren't a lot of resources available, um, not a lot of jobs available. Probably the biggest employers are the local schools um, and maybe the mayor's office as well. Um, my host family pretty much made their money from agriculture. Um, they sold their cheese in Yerevan. That was their livelihood for the most part. Um, so, so yeah, and there's some Balchabert, if anyone's been there. Um, So regarding my village and the environment, um, I kind of had a pretty unique situation where we didn't really have lack of water. Unlike most villages, we had constant water running through the village, um, which is not what most villages dealt with. A lot of them, especially in the Aragat Soden area, had to have water sent in from Tallinn, which is a local city nearby. Um, I have a very unique school director who was pretty proactive when it came to environmental issues. Uh, during April 24th, 2015, we actually did like a school-wide trash pickup, um, which ended up being burning the trash, which is obviously not good for the environment, but um, it's also the only resources available. We don't have trash pickup in villages at all. Oh, it's okay. Yeah. Um, so he seemed to be pretty interested in trying to make the community better. The lack of resources in villages, while it's obviously an issue when it comes to protecting the environment and having, you know, for example, trash pickup, I think it also creates more ownership in the village and it's easier for community like interaction and grassroots movement. And my local stream, which is where the water constantly runs through, you can see, unfortunately, there's some trash there. That was a huge dumping area of trash. But there's also lavas being used as a way to um, stabilize the wall. Yeah, um, it was an EU project. 
there's there's garbage like down. Sorry, though. Yeah, those are cars. Um, they are used to stabilize the wall. Yeah, it's on purpose. Um, I thought it was really amazing. It was my favorite part about my village. Um, a lot of people really liked it. I don't know how the villagers really felt, but you know. Um, and then my best friend lived in Hunsaras village, which is probably one of the most famous villages. Has a famous gorge. Um, so during my time in Armenia, I noticed, and I, I think most of us did know this, that tourism started to pick up more. And it became an issue in Hunsaras, the trash that was starting to collect in the gorge. And the solution um, became that they encouraged the villagers to not throw trash in the gorge, but to throw it where tourists couldn't see it. Um, but that, yes, that's a problem. But that also means that people are becoming more aware of how the environment will impact tourism. So I think it's also, it's good too. Um, my good friend lived in Jermuk, which is, you know, the biggest tourist city to go to, one of them. Um, and she noticed that the, so Jermuk does have trash collection. Um, however, the, they move it to a different site, but there's no trash compacting. So a lot of the wind has caused the trash to spread elsewhere. And she did talk about with some community members about organizing a trash pickup. And a lot of them really did not want to do that because they felt that it was the government's job to do so. Um, and there was not, there didn't seem to be much government incentive to really try and take care of the problem. Um, she also, saw a mine come and be built within the area. Um, the mining company invested a lot of money into Jermuk to build up some goodwill. I believe they built like an arts facility. Um, she found some community, mem community members that did have problems with it and they were really concerned about the environment, but they also felt really disempowered to do much about it because they felt that it was the mayor and the government's will against theirs. And many people within Jermuk also felt like it was a good thing they were coming because of the jobs. And Kaban, um, which is also known for its mining, very uh, well known for its mining. My friend said that the biggest river that ran through Kaban apparently used to be really filled with trash, but the government came, I believe, like four or five years ago for its anniversary founding of the city and the government, the local government made a big incentive to clean up the trash to try and impress the national government. Um, the mines were, a lot of the people in Kapan remarked about how beautiful the tail ponds were, like the fluorescent lights, which made him sort of think that maybe they weren't quite aware of maybe the problems that was being created by these mines. Um, he, he also said that um, the uh, Kajaran, which is the like village near one of the mines, it's known as being fairly wealthy in the area. Um, we Peace Corps volunteers actually weren't allowed to go there because the water wasn't able to pass the testing. So while the village is really wealthy, they clearly have some health issues that might be coming along the way. Um, and then, um, I just wanted to leave, like, despite the problems within Armenia, the environmental problems, it's not all lost. There's still a lot of really great grassroots movements going on there. Um, my friend lived in Korton Village, which is near Stepanavan, and her students actually created, like, a, they wrote a grant for the local uh, village to have trash bins, which is, they did it on their own incentive. And, um, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, George and Mom. Um, so now let's. Well, I'll just do only one round of questions and uh, questions, uh, and then I'll open this up for um, to the audience. The first, I, I think, what is emerging from this discussion um, is the in when we do think about uh, Armenia's capacities in environmental governance, it seems like some of the problems are related to poor capacities. Some of it is political will and power that Ursula uh, touched on. So my question, my first question is to Alan. Alan, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on the issue of the lack of know-how. How does Armenia compare, do you think, in terms of its pure administrative capacities when, it's com when it comes to administrative go governance uh, to perhaps regionally, our neighbors in the region, or maybe countries in, uh, or internationally to international standards? 
in a, sub, a related question has to do with the fact that now there are more actors in the area of uh, environmental governance who have private act, uh, actors. To what extent this emergence of these new actors, multinational companies, for example, uh, creates challenges for exercising accountability over them? Uh, are they uh, sort of a capacity, uh, challenging their means capacities, the capacity of the statehood, or uh, it's, it's more of a, how, how should we be thinking about accountability, uh, as well as uh, institutions in the context of environment, now that there are all of these actors? Um, all right. Uh, uh, obviously, the topics are very, um, you know, we can talk hours about them, but let me just make a couple of uh, remarks about, uh, about the points you're raising, Anna. Is, uh, the first being that, that um, uh, when it comes to uh, multinationals coming in, we, uh, first, I have to say that uh, none of the big multinationals, uh, uh, nationals in the same classic sense. I mean, none of the big companies working in, especially in the mining sector, they're not significant global players. So in that sense, they're not uh, um, typical multinationals. Um, uh, they do, however, for instance, uh, Lydian International is a listed company in the Toronto uh, Exchange. So uh, there are some of them are publicly held companies that uh, has certain uh, uh, advantages if you want to have uh, levers on on them in terms of, of pushing for transparency, pushing for uh, accountability, because they have to be also uh, accountable uh, more broadly internationally. Uh, where some of the closed companies that are are privately held, like uh, the Chronimets. Uh, which owns uh, Chronomet is a German company that, that owns 60% of the of the Kajaran mine. Uh, they are not publicly held companies, and uh, that's, uh, that but does that does bring up issues about uh, pushing them for accountability and, and responsibility. Um, and uh, and of course, I'm, I don't want to say uh, Lydian is any uh, at this point is any uh, uh, get. Is off the hook because they are uh, somehow listed um, uh, on, on, a, on an exchange. Uh, but it does allow for some additional tools of transparency and, 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 and accountability that may not be available for some of the other companies. Uh, uh, when it comes to, so I, 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 mean, I mean, the question whether this threatens earning a statehood or not, I mean, that's a very complex question. I'm probably not the right person to be to keep commenting on that. But my sense is uh, whatever uh, statehood model uh, Armenia is, is evolving, developing, it has to include this kind of multinational players as part of the, the its, uh, its work. Uh, because it cannot be uh, just a, a, a very isolated country that only is beholden to one interest and one uh, you know, uh, strategic partner, uh, Russia for instance. Uh, uh, as, as the sole kind of uh, global partner that it needs to work with. So I think that it, it, uh, it's a challenge that Armenia should embrace and should, should uh, find ways of dealing with it effectively within its broader uh, attempts to connect with the global community. Uh, one comment on, on governance I wanted to make uh, and maybe related to this whole issue of statehood and, and also governance uh, capabilities is the issue of data. There's plenty of um, data that Armenian government itself generates on environmental health. There's plenty of data that, for instance, our School of Public Health at the American University and our center, uh, Center for Responsible Mining, have produced uh, with respect to uh, soil pollution, uh, you know, lead level in children's blood, uh, and, and, and so on. Uh, the, the issue here, of course, is not so much to generate this data. No one blocks you from generating data uh, and, and information and analysis. The issue is, does this information have any impact on policy? And it doesn't. That's the problem. There's a, there's a schism, uh, schism kind of between uh, information and decision making. And I think that's uh, one of the key uh, problems in Armenia that, that we need to make policy uh, decision-making more evidence-based and, um, and 
it goes along with capacity, but but also uh, uh, the, the whole issue of, of trust that I was I was raising earlier. That uh, it, if you, when you do not do that, it just erodes trust, and and that creates a governance uh, uh, problems of its own. So. Excellent point. Um, actually, evidence-based policymaking is something that is a challenge right now here in the United States as well. So um, there's a lot to cover. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alan. So since we're talking on, about accountability and we're talking about power, perhaps it'd be a good time to talk about uh, environmental activism. And environmental activism is in the foundation of the formation of Armenian statehood, right? National self-determination movements around Nagorno-Karabakh were intertwined with environmental movements. Um, but this question is perhaps a better answered, uh, but feel free, everyone can comment, obviously. To Ursula and Jason, how would you assess environmental activism? How, how did it evolve over the past few years? Where are we right now? Well, I guess one thing, one observation, uh, one challenge we face around environmental activism, I would say there's a huge capacity issue in Armenia among the, the grassroots kind of activist community. Um, we've observed, I'm sure most people would agree, just moving from issue to issue, crisis to crisis, not making a lot of headway. Uh, there's been some success stories, some big ones, um, kind of piling up, but more or less it's issue to issue in a very reactionary kind of mode. Um, the other thing is kind of the orientation of, of, our, um, of our activism. It tends to get very tightly aligned with um, the opposition parties in Armenia. So I think it gets very politicized, uh, and I think that sort of prevents it from uh, building into a more grassroots or a wider movement among the public in Armenia. So it tends to, I think it sort of limits the, the scale of the the movement when it becomes very closely aligned with um, different political actors or different political views. I'll just give one quick example, just a, a quick critique of there was a petition generated about one of the mines um, recently and just this, the, the opening line is sort of a rant against you know the corrupt you know establishment in power so it kind of really doesn't allow a broad base of people to say, yeah, I, I believe in that and I want to join that. It, it kind of politicizes it and I think it kind of limits their, um, their base by doing that, which is, you know, I think sort of a challenge for activists to uh, broaden and sort of learn how to build a movement instead of being so kind of uh, trying to cover all of the bases every time. I agree with all of that. Um, and we have worked together in the past um, on one campaign in particular, um, which actually had to do with mining, the death loop mining. Uh, and one additional point I'll just add to that is that, um, again, the, the difficult question of what can the diaspora do. Um, in that particular instance, I think that was, for, for me anyway, it was a unique um, opportunity to support local activists who we were involved with them, we were communicating with them, and at the time we, uh, our organizations each had people um, on the ground with them, in, I mean, living in Armenia. And so uh, we were able to coordinate uh, not just you know sending letters to the government, which we did, but uh, also putting, uh, or at least discussing potential, um, I guess, protests, but different actions. It, more broadly speaking, uh, for those international actors in those in the cities where they're based, and that is, uh, you know, something that I think we, you know, uh, activists in Armenia could really develop um, that sort of network. I mean, there's there's people who uh, want to do that, who want to support, um, and you know, we have communities in so many cities. So if you have a, a an investor uh, or a firm that's based somewhere in particular, we most likely have some sort of community there, um, and if not a protest, then some sort of action, maybe a meeting, maybe information being given to those invest that investor or that actor, 
um, could be a potential opportunity as long as it's done, um, you know, in partnership and not in some sort of top-down, you know, this is what we're going to go do, as long as it's in partnership with the, part, uh, with the activists um, and those who are concerned in Armenia. Um, one other point, I just, a, a micro point I want to clarify, um, because Alan did actually speak to that uh, point of uh, whether the government blocks uh, funding. I, you know, I, I think I took that um, comment from people who were there. So I, I and I, I knew that you know it might be a little bit um, strong, but I will say that I have also talked to people um, many years ago now. So it's it's dated, but uh, people actually at AUA as well before many years ago, and um, it was actually an issue of a lack of interest. So I'll clarify that point um, that that was uh, confirmed through various sources. It's a lack of interest as well, um, if nothing else, from the government. And I think that that is yet another opportunity, uh, whether it's from activists in Armenia, whether it's um, something that, that could be worked on in partnership outside of Armenia, but how do we increase the interest for funding to see if there are increased cancer rates in certain areas, if that's something that people want to know. Um, and I agree that there's a lot of data out there, but is it, uh, you know, is it everything we want to know? Is it strategic? Is it something uh, for those biggest issues that we're discussing? And, and that, that's it. But basically, not only we have to produce the data, but also advocate for evidence-based policy making. So it's not just, as Alan pointed out, just having the information, but also knowing what to do with it. And, and which is has also, a strategy. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, um, uh, one quick question to Emma. You know, we had conversations about the rural-urban divide when it comes to the way people experience some of these environmental challenges. Would you be able to comment on this? And perhaps and this would be also a good time to start talking about where does diaspora fit in this conversation? Can diaspora, uh, groups from diaspora, or individuals, or communities be players in environmental governance in Armenia? Sure. And we can open this up to uh, audience. Um, I mean, yeah, of course, people should be players within the environment, um, especially with the villages. A lot of the, especially like most of the tourism, the big sites are in villages of the monasteries. Um, I think that that's a big economic uh, opportunity for the villages. And it's important to clean them up, obviously, because tourists want to see things that are pretty. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I, I think, personally, I think that tourism should be the biggest push that Armenia is having for the environment. It does seem to be that they're going more towards mining, um, which is not helping spread wealth at all. I think tourism would have more of an opportunity for average people to be able to have access to economic opportunities. So the development of impact is important. Fascinating. Let's, uh, let's, uh, let me open this up for uh, discussion, and uh, we'll start collecting questions. Not all at once. <laughs> okay, I'll go one and two. Yeah. So I wanted to reflect on this question of cancer. Um, it's like Armenia has an unusually high rates of cancer, especially in some type of cancers. Armenia has twice the cancer rates than in neighboring Georgia, Azerbaijan, and Turkey. Um, and um, it's nobody seems to understand where this is coming from. Um, you know, I, I want, like, that, that what really worries me is that there's very little discussion. It seems to be about the about this particular problem. Some estimated five to ten thousand people die in Armenia from cancer every year. That's three something like hundred times more the number of people who die fighting Azeris on the border. Hundred times more. Uh, and I, I personally don't know of any non-governmental organizations or any kind of uh, foundations that are actively going after these questions. I don't know of anyone who's actually actively researching this to understand where this is coming from. Typically, when an effect is twice higher than expected, it should not be that hard to figure out where it's coming from. So I talked to some of my friends who actually do data science and things like that. They said that they did try to get some data from Ministry of Health and do some analysis, do some statistical analysis, understand find some correlations, find out as to which particular parameters is cancer incidence most related to. Is it age? Is it location? Is it, uh, you know, uh, the economic status? They found out that most of the data they can get is so deeply anonymized. Apparently, Armenia has extremely strict regulations about um, uh, patient confidentiality, so that all the data they get basically has almost no information about age, location, 
know, et cetera, et cetera, the type of cancer, so, no, can, type of cancer is there. So is someone actually going after this problem? Because this is a big problem. I mean, this is like really probably talk about security, right? We might be, um, as maybe a few extra thousand people are dying every year in Armenia because of some effect or some, some kind of a problem that maybe is not that hard to fix. We're talking about thousands of people, so, you know, lives per year. It is a perfect example to demonstrate how we need to be thinking about security differently. That's right. Also, if we get this data, also, we finally can have, as, like, data, as you said, evidence driven policy. Yeah. You know? Thank you. So I'll also take a question from Stefan. Yeah, my question has to do with uh, the feelings of the local citizens toward this. I mean, there, to me, there's two very, there's lots of levels of this problem, but at the very upper echelon, you have the corporate, the money side of this, you know, the mining areas, multinationals. But at the grassroots level, um, in this country, this country was a dump before the 60s. We didn't respect our water, our air, our soil. What you described about Armenia, it was America before the 60s. So things can change. Who recycled 20 years ago? Now you, you have a crisis of ability and actually do their jobs. Can I just add one point on Costa Rica? Sure. Uh, there has been um, uh, some of our, our activists, uh, and not activists, they're actually environmental, you know, uh, uh, organizations that work for have been um, uh, using Costa Rica as an example of, of a country where you know Armenia is now about 13 uh, percent protected area uh, natural uh, areas that are protected um, and uh, Costa Rica is one of those countries where I think 100 percent is protected area considered protected area um, and so they've been arguing we should go the Costa Rica model or 100 percent of Armenia should become protected areas uh, and and uh, various degrees of protection, obviously. But so I mean, Costa Rica serves as a model for a lot of countries in terms of how you use the natural assets to to develop your economy. Uh, does Armenia have the, the the wealth of natural diversity and the natural attractions that that can sustain a whole economy? Uh, it has a lot that is not being used, and I think ecotourism. Uh, if, if done right, it could bring a lot of good to, to rural communities. Uh, and and uh, that's one way the diaspora can be helpful also. You can become ecotourists. Um, and so you can you can get engaged in, in, in village communities, go stay there, uh, find out what the issues are, um, and, uh, and just enjoy the culinary uh, offerings, the the connection of the rural areas to the natural world, and, and wildlife, and so. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, the, anyone wanted to take up the question of arson advocacy? And I would. Uh, there's one more question in the back. Oh, the questions are emerging. Ah, I'll take a picture. I'll, I'll try with Judy's question. Okay. Just make some. You know. Um, I think you know it's an it's an area that hasn't been fully I think exploited uh, in Armenia where there is a strong arts culture. Um, I, we have dabbled in it to some extent. Where uh, like one of the things that Ursula mentioned, we did the we did a petition on the Tegut mine issue, where we had um, Serge Tankian involved, which brings a huge amount of uh, awareness to the to the issue. He's very outspoken. He sort of puts the politics ahead of the, the music, in his case, um, which is something that I really admire. Uh, so that did bring some attention. It brings kind of youth youth attention to it. Um, also, his we um, used music from his band, from System of a Down, in one of our videos, which was really interesting because, you know, a typical video might get a few hundred or a few thousand views. This one got like 25,000 views just by having their clip of, of part of a song in it. Um, but the other just sort of thing that I would just add to this um, is I think I've noticed from talking with friends, colleagues that are young environmental activists in Armenia, I think they're sort of living this kind of 60s renaissance now. I mean, maybe this is kind of part of what Alan was getting at where, where there is this level of aware, environmental awareness now that's happening in Armenia. Um, 
you know, they're listening to similar music and similar styles and similar kind of worldviews that we had in the States in the 60s. So I think it's, there is this kind of, there is this artistic kind of element to it that's kind of driving the activism. Same project, sorry to keep going back to that project, but it was very fun. Um, so the um, environmental education um, at the waste management project in um, the rural area near the border, um, we actually did have, uh, with our partner organizations, we had um, festival a festival and then a couple of contests for upcycling. And the kids you know, had so much fun with it. It was very artistic. I was really impressed with what they were able to turn, uh, you know, what they brought from home as trash. And they, were, they made it into things that were even functional, not just cute, but, but, also, but also just artistic. And they, they beautified the school with some of it. And um, actually, one other project. Uh, sorry, I, I know I'm not, you know, I'm touting the projects, but but to see that the answer to your question of how people were inspired by it or or um, were they inspired by it, I would say yes. There was one other um, beautification of a green space in Harastan. Uh, there was a park that had been abandoned, and we had some of the community members. In fact, one of our staff members was from there. That's how we, this all came to happen. It you know came to be and. Uh, she was able to get the community on board, and actually the local government was able to help us with some of the materials. So it was a, a really good experience, and they spent the day beautifying painting um, and really using artistic skill to make it somewhere they wanted to go to play, and as I understand it, they do use it now. So, um, And it, it all tied into environmental um, sort of awareness as well. Um, I, uh, uh, I see some more comments. We are really short on time. If there is a question, a super quick question for Alan, we'll take it. But if there are for the other panelists, you can perhaps ask the questions to the panelists over refreshments. Yeah, okay. But super quick, please. Yeah. You want me to speak fast or make a short question? Oh, make a short question. <laughs> Possibly. Or both. I guess this may be a little bit of a rhetorical question, but I guess I didn't get a good sense of what the biggest barrier to the progress of environmental protection is. I mean, I, I think I have a sense, but uh, no one came out and said, well, what is preventing progress? I just want to mention, about 10 years ago, this is from the Irene Tree Project. I was going to throw these out a few weeks ago, and I just looked at them. I, I felt mad. I looked at them. And these were three videos, one on the deforestation, one on the mines, and the other one about the water with Lake Seven. They go, it's the same issues bring back and brought up 10 years from now. So maybe just really briefly comment on where are the biggest barriers to moving forward? So it's, it's back to a capacity or a political will. I think that's where we well, are. That's right, right. Yeah, very good. Um, why would you ask the question? Uh, all right, one quick question is, I was gonna talk about, since we're talking about energy, environment, security, what is going to happen after 2026 when the nuclear power plant is nominally supposed to shut down, although it probably won't happen. Because that provides 40% of Armenia's electricity and eight years when it comes to replacing 400 megawatts of powers is an instant in time. And it's right now, I don't understand what Armenians are going to do after 2000. That, that's and, actually and, important. And, and, yeah, photovoltaics are not going to do it for a whole variety of reasons. Because sun doesn't shine when we burn electricity in the evening. And neither, the, neither does the wind blow. So. Because it's such a, such a big topic, we actually thought that we might probably do another panel specifically on that. That's why we structured the questions, but there was not central. Uh, exploring villages uh, in Armenia and um, sites of uh, archaeological and historical sites uh, that aren't usually visited, you go down these small little valleys or up these little streams, and in inevitably you find um, tailing dumps uh, and retaining walls or dams on streams and rivers and so forth. And uh, uh, some people that I've talked to said, well, they line the bottom of this uh, reservoir with clay or with plastic or whatever, and it should last 20 years. But Armenia is a country that celebrates its adoption of Christianity and the uh, establishment of uh, Erepuni and so forth. And these are 100 years or thousand years and so forth. So what happens after that? After every village and stream and uh, valley gets uh, fills up with toxic waste, then what? What's the future of Armenia? Let's say 200 years from now. Um, very good. Thank you. Um, so if, if 
If any of our panelists would like to tackle the first question, I think if, 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 if there's one simple answer as to what is the biggest barrier to better environmental governance, to better environmental future. Um, if anyone would like to tackle that, that'd be great. Uh, nuclear one, I'm, I'm thinking we can talk uh, out when we over refreshments if possible. Um, as well as the joke. Yeah. If I could just make a, a, a one point, and I think you know all of these questions obviously require lots of discussion, and they're very you know the issues are very complex, but uh, I, I think often uh, and Armenia hasn't found and it does some of the rhetoric, but uh, um, when you look at some of the uh, national policy documents and sustainable development goals, and you know before that the Millennium uh, uh, Development Goals. And uh, when you read some of these documents, there is a, a sense that they, uh, it's, it is an attempt to, uh, to go towards green economy, towards you know, uh, uh, aligning environmental reality or, or health with uh, economic uh, dem demand for economic growth. Uh, and, and yet, we haven't figured out how to do it. And that often what it comes down to it is whether we look, use like Savan for energy generation. That means lowering the uh, the lake's uh, uh, level. Uh, you know, doing fisheries uh, in, uh, in in Lake Savan, which puts uh, excess you know nitrogen and phosphorus uh, stress on the on the lake, uh, and and investing in in wastewater treatment, which reduces the uh, the you know environmental stress on Lake Savan. And so uh, we haven't figured out how to do the economic make uh, growth and yet be able to uh, to uh, uh, not use uh, the resource in, in a way that that harms the, the resource itself and I think that's there's a there's an issue of know-how there there's an issue of short-term uh, economic gain uh, 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 versus a long-term uh, economic health and, and I think you know these are challenges any any leader would have to uh, face when they're trying to govern a country, uh, and and uh, often uh, the, the decision goes let's go for the short term gain, uh, which in our perspective it's unfortunate, uh, and and sometimes uh, the decisions are not made with the best uh, you know know how and and world practice in terms of how to combine the. The, the, the short-term needs of the country with the long-term uh, sustainability uh, concerns. So that's, uh, I think, the economic one uh, is often brought as the argument why we need to do this now. Uh, and think about the environmental health later. Uh, and, and I think that's, a, that's something we need to continue to tackle and, and show that, that the twain shall coexist. Very good. Thank you so very much, Alan, for staying up so well, so late. And uh, please join me in thanking our panelists here, Emma, Ursula, and Jason. And <laughs>